Yesterday we talked about how to create the functional medicine practice of your dreams, so today we're going to talk about part two. And so one of the things I told you yesterday was that timing is everything. When we're, when we're talking about marketing, we're looking at market trends. If you look at the glu I'm going to use gluten-free as an example. Ten years ago when I started gluten-free, I was crazy. Everybody looked at me funny. You really want me to avoid bread? Whole grain is healthy. And it was about timing. I knew I was doing the right thing. I knew I was ahead of the curve. My patients knew I was ahead of the curve. They were getting better, so my conviction was there. And timing was everything, because what it allowed me to do was position myself as a leader, as an authority, as an expert, 10 years before anybody was ever even really considering it, at least in the large public eye. And so today, I'm reaping huge benefit, both spiritually, personally, financially, from sticking to my guns and sticking to my convictions. And so when I say timing is everything, I really mean that with functional medicine. Functional medicine has been around a long time and it's been called many things. But now it's called functional medicine and functional medicine is what's getting ready to explode. Right? The gluten-free diet was called many things. It was Atkins and South Beach. Those were gluten-free diets for the most part, right? So. Market trends come and go, and good messages are always good messages, but the names of them might change based on the market. Functional medicine is where medicine is headed, and in another five years, if you position yourself today to be a functional medicine expert, in another five years, you're not going to be chasing everyone else. Timing is everything. So those who establish themselves will be positioned as pioneers. You want to look at yourself and see yourself, and you want your patients to see you as a pioneer, not as a bandwagoner. Look at all the bandwagoners with gluten-free now. If you look at what I've created with Gluten-Free Society, and the new terminology, and the new, and the new verbiage, and the new test procedures that I've established as criteria and fundamental for those uh, in the gluten-free realm, those are things that I created, and you want to be that pioneer that's creating things in your niche. So you have your niche, and you want to be the one who is on cutting edge of everything in that niche. Become a pioneer. You establish yourself now, you'll become wealthy of body, mind, spirit, and bank account. And all are equally important. As we talked about yesterday, money is a means to an end, and so having it gives power. Right? Having it gives you the power and the freedom to pursue your studies, to treat your patients on your terms, not theirs. I threw this little image up there because yesterday I showed you the power of what one email can do when you, establish, when you establish online credibility. And so this is just one more day from that same email. I didn't send out another email. This is just one more day of earnings. So we just added to it. So that one email, you see they earned me over $1,100. So while I'm here up on stage talking to you guys, this is all happening. And I get to go home and take a day off on Monday because I've worked hard, right? So hard work now equates to passive income later down the road. But that's about positioning. That couldn't have happened had I not had a vision, had I not been ahead of the curve, had I not had the timing when the timing was right. If I jump into gluten today, how hard would it be for me to become the expert when everybody's being the expert, right? You guys understand what I'm saying? You have a unique position today with functional medicine to launch yourself as a pioneer. Do it. So we talked yesterday about building a seven-figure practice, and I laid out components of what you needed to do online. And then I laid out what you needed to do offline to establish this. And so today I want to talk a little bit about we talked about tools that you would need, but I want to talk about a couple of other tools that we didn't talk about yesterday that you'll also need. And one of them is the ability to sell. How many of you think you're a salesman or woman? How many of you think of it, it's your job to sell? Right? We're all in the business of selling. Everyone is in the world. Anyone who works, has a job, is in the business to sell. And for whatever weird reason, the, you know, the 10,000 pound elephant in the room with doctors has always been, if you sell, you're bad. If you have a pharmacy in your office, you're perceived as evil. And I, I, there was a question earlier about, well, what does your patient think? Who cares what your patient thinks? 
Literally, who cares what they think? Do you think about what do they think when you send them to Quest Labs and Quest sends them a bill? No, you don't care. You do what they need. You provide what they need. And so anytime you are not selling, anytime you are losing in your mind or losing that connection for you to have the ability to be a salesperson, it's in your head, not theirs. The resistance is your fault, not their fault. And you have to get over that right now today. If you walk away from this meeting with any gift from me, it's walk out of here knowing that you need to be the best damn salesperson in the world because without that, you can't get anybody better. Because part of getting patients better is convincing them and selling them what they need. If you do it ethically, it's not an issue. You don't, you don't use psychology and you don't get in their head and you don't do things unethically. I, I, I was talking to somebody last night about, you know, any of you Star Wars fans? I love Star Wars. I'm a child of the 80s. Um, you know, Jedis, right? They use the Force, right? And so you have Jedis who are good. They're ethical, they're moral people, and they use their abilities to help and to aid. And then you have the Sith, right? The Dark Lords. And they use the same abilities for bad purpose. How many of you have ever hired a contractor who did a great job? How many of you have ever hired a contractor who did a horrible job? Okay. If you hire a contractor, they do a horrible job. Are you done forever with hiring contractors? Right? So just because somebody is bad doesn't mean all of that, that profession is bad. And so what do I mean by that is that you want to use all the tools that you have to sell. You want to use psychology to sell. You want to know who your patient is, what's in their mind, what is your avatar, so that you can sell them better. You're using psychology. You're using the force so that you convince them to do what they need to do to get better. Does that make sense? If you don't do that, then the guy selling noni juice is going to tell him about his cousin and his grandma who were in wheelchairs, who all got better magically, miraculously, and they're going to go buy $300 worth of noni juice, and they're never going to get better, because noni juice isn't going to cure them, right? So you have to have the ability to sell. Clearing the air, what we should know about doctors. We all have good intentions. Is there a person in this room that's just here to make money, or is everybody really here to become more successful doctors and to do better at what they do to, so that they can help more people? I believe that about everybody in the room. I, I believe everybody has good intentions. I even believe that doctors who don't practice functional medicine have the best intentions in the world. They just don't know what functional medicine is, because if they did, they'd be practicing it. You have good intentions for your patients. You are a moral and ethical person. That's an assumption. We shouldn't assume anything other about doctors. Making money is not evil or bad. Making money is a means to an end that allows you the freedom and the tools to bring great things to the world. How could I give freely? How could I put on an event like this if I wasn't in a situation to do it? Right? How could I have shared all this knowledge with everybody in this room this weekend if I wasn't successful, right? So money for me was a means to an end to bring this knowledge to doctors and because my mission is to help more, right? I make more money so that I can help more doctors so that I can help more doctors make more money and help more patients, right? It's not bad or evil. It's a means to an end. So you should think about it more. Everyone does. The social taboo among doctors when it comes to discussing money is as if making money equates to not caring about patients. So clear the air. Go ahead and take that mindset that you might have or that you might be clinging to and just, right now, wash it away, get rid of it. Know that you're here to make more money. You are. This is a marketing summit. So let's talk about the art of patient compliance. Our job is very simple, and if we think about it analytically, what is our job? It's to get people better. They come to see us, they want to get better. So if we're not good salesmen and we don't convince them what they need to do to get better, whose fault is it? Look in the mirror. So looking at this analytically, how do we accomplish this when patients and doctors can sometimes be their own worst enemies? 
Remember what I just said a minute ago. Walk out of here knowing that you need to make more money and be more successful and be a better salesperson. Do not be your own worst enemy. If you're scared to sell, if you're scared to ask about money or talk about money, you're going to do yourself a disservice. You're going to do your patients a disservice. Your patients sometimes are their own worst enemy because they're used to a system and they're used to a marketing uh, platform where they're told to eat this and they're told to exercise this way. And so you're having to counter effect everything that they've been marketed to for the last 30 or 40 or 50 years in your office. And so sometimes they're their own worst enemy because they think they know, even though they're in your office asking for your advice, right? And so the first rule is know what their mentality is. They may think what they know, but there's an old saying. You guys ever heard the saying, you don't know what you don't know? How many of you came to this seminar this weekend, not really knowing what to expect, kind of it was a risk-taking thing, right? You didn't know what you were going to get. You had no idea what you were going to get. I know what you're getting because I know how valuable it is, but you didn't know that when you signed up for the seminar. And sometimes your patients are that way too. They don't know the value because it hasn't been laid out for them yet, right? You guys have gotten value so far. Would anybody disagree that this hasn't been the most valuable seminar of the year in terms of, of going home and, and applying and becoming successful? Would anybody argue that? Stand up now. Grab a hold your feet. <laughs> so, sick patient plus smart doctor. Fill in the blank. Does that lead to a healthy patient? No. Not necessarily. Can. Will it? You can have the smartest doctor in the world. But the doctor's not a salesman. Sick patient plus smart doctor equals sick patient equals doctor who goes out of business. The valedictorian of my class doesn't, I'm a chiropractor, the valedictorian of my class doesn't even adjust patients. The valedictorian of my wife's class, he's not even a chiropractor anymore, doesn't even do it anymore, failed. Smart people don't make great clinicians or great salespeople. Smart doctor plus a doctor who can sell plus a doctor who won't quit. And what I mean by that is, as a doctor, you should have a promise to your patients. And one of the things psychologically, I say to every one of my patients, you have to make a point to communicate things if you want them to be understood. Communication is critical. When my patient, is, before they leave that room, one of the things I say to every patient, and write this down, because you're going to want to say it too, is you came to me for a reason. The seven or eight or nine or ten other doctors that you visited haven't done it right, whatever, whatever has happened, it, it hasn't worked for you. It was something we're not going to repeat here. And my promise to you is that I will never quit trying to get you better. We're going to order some tests. We're going to investigate some things. But I promise you, even if what we find out in this first batch, in this first round of things that we're investigating doesn't get you better, I will never quit looking for the answer for you. Because if I didn't say that, I wouldn't even want to take their case. How many doctors have ever said that to a patient? How many of you have ever said that to a patient? What I hear a lot is I don't like to sell. New patients do not equal success. Some of the guys yesterday were talking about that sales funnel, right, where you have this chronic scramble to get new people to buy, new patients coming in, the chronic scramble for new people. You don't necessarily need a, a ton of new patients. New patients don't equal success. Compliant new patients equal success. Patients that get better equal success, right? There are doctors charging huge case fees and not getting anyone any better, and they're making a lot of money right now, but they're going to go out of business eventually. Unethical and immoral businesses can't sustain longevity. They never do. The market demands that they won't. To get patients to comply, you have to understand psychology and mindset of a patient. Who's your avatar? Your avatar is sick and tired of being sick and tired. We've all heard that. 